Today, I'm joined by Yvette Lalova. Yvette has been nominated by Ekaterina Aframova in a previous interview. Yvette is quadruple Olympian, competed 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016 in track and field. You reached three Olympic finals in total, European champion, outdoors, indoors, European junior champion, and I quote Wikipedia, not to get uh, to choose the wrong wording here. You are the 12th fastest woman in the history of the 100 meters and the fastest sprinter of not West African descent. Welcome, Yvette. Hello, thank you so much for the invitation and for your patience to do this interview. Well, I have to thank you for your time. Yvette, Considering you're a successful track and field athlete for so many years, how did you fall in love with competitive track and field? Honestly, both my parents were athletes, they're former athletes. So um, as a child growing up at home, I listened to all these stories about the competitions, about friendships, training camps. And I think that... I didn't realize that by the time, but inside of me, I built this idea that the sport and athletics, it's something so beautiful and gives so much. So one day I just opened the wardrobe and I found a, an old tracksuit of my father uh, with, the, with the sign Bulgaria on the back. And I said, Dad, I, I want to have one of these. Can I, can I wear this? And he said, N -n -n, no, this, this is a national team track suits so if you want to have one of those you have to train and uh, there i was already training some gymnastics as a kid and swimming so it, was, uh, it was a way to switch to, to track and field and this is the beginning of my story okay how old were you back then um i was 12 when i started with track yeah i was 12 and it was it was really hard in in bulgaria by that time to find a coach who was willing to work with, uh, with kids. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Uh, my darkest moment for sure was uh, when I broke my femur the year after the Olympic Games 2015. I won, as you said before, the, the European indoor title in the 200 meters. And um, from then on, it was uh, supposed to be the, the beginning of, of my good career, of a, of a really strong year that uh, I can improve my results in the sprints. But instead of that, um, at the same place that I, I had such an amazing success at the Olympic Games, which is the Athens Olympic Stadium, at the same place there, I actually broke my femur during a warm-up for a competition in the summer. And this was my darkest moment because it took me many years and really hard work and um, a, lot of, a lot of tears to, to come back, actually. Yeah. And how did it happen? I mean, did you run into and I mean, you col collided or what was it? Actually, there was an athlete who was running against me on the opposite direction because um, they actually had asked us to, to warm up at the indoor track. And you know, this indoor track that they're like half turn. So when you start running from one side, you actually don't see what's coming from the opposite side. And in my case, there was an athlete running in my direction and there were hurdles and the wall. So trying to reduce my speed, it happened. I like to explain it. Usually it happens like if you hit the brakes of a car mm. and you try to kill the speed so fast. I lost my balance for a second. I, I remember falling down, rolling. And actually in, in one of those rolls that I did on the track, I, in some way my, my leg was in, in a position that when I hit the, the track, my femur broke in two. Mm. So this is, this is how it happened. And it was, it was quite scary, not only for me, but also for the other athletes who were there and for my former coach, who was also a witness of, of everything that happened. Yeah. And it also, I read you declined a compensation from the fellow competitor as well as from the organizer. And you received the IOC Sports Fair Play Award for that. Why did you choose to decline 
the compensation? Because the damage was, the, was just done. Anything that I was doing afterward was not going to bring my, my bone healthy again. So I'm not the kind of person who is trying to, to blame the others or trying to, you know, um, escape from responsibility. From the moment that thing happened to me, I acted as my destiny, as my fate. And I focused on working and giving my best to come back. And um, yeah, that, that was my goal. So for me, if, if I was looking for compensation or anything, it was not going to change my life for better. Mm, okay, really cool. How did you recover from that moment? Really hard, really hard. I spent a few weeks at the hospital in Athens where, where they had to operate me uh, urgently. And um, then I spent some months in a German clinic, in Bulgaria, different places that um, I could find the, the best, really the best um, conditions so I can recover. It. But uh, I think the key moment in my recovery was um, that I made it as I was preparing for the Olympics. It was not like, um, you know, okay, let me take some time off and this and that. And by that time, I didn't understand my coach as being so strict about it, but later on I appreciated his um, motivation to continue on this path and doing every step of the process really professionally. Mm. Okay. And um, in previous interviews I heard from other athletes, uh, the physical recovery normally goes a little bit quicker than the mental recovery. Was that the same in your case? Well, I love to say that what saved me when that thing happened was that I was really young. I was 21 by that time. And uh, in, in my head, there was no possibility that I'm not coming back and I'm not running again. So I had no idea what I'm facing and how long it's going to take, how hard it's going to be. And uh, I never thought about it. So, of course, I had my dark moments. And um, as I said, I, I cried a lot. It was really tough for me watching the World Championships in Helsinki later, that the same season that I, I wanted so bad to be there and compete. But um, I worked. I worked even on that and uh, it saved me. But mostly my motivation to come back saved me, really. Okay, cool. There's another question I've written down here which interests me. In June 2004... You set your personal best on the 100 meters with 10.77. Two months later at the Olympic Games, the gold medal goes away with 10.93. Is that something that goes to an athlete's head? Of course. I was so, I was so close to these medals. And um, honestly, the Olympic Games was my first big event after the, the, junior, the European Junior Championships the year before. So when I got there... The goal I had set by my coach, of course, was uh, to do my best to get to the final. Because this was something so big and I was only 20 years old, so nobody really expected anything from me. I already had enough pressure running that result in, in the season previously. So going to the Olympics, everything was so different, so new that uh, many people thought that I'm going to burn out and I'm not going even to to run close to, to any good result. But I think that uh, by that time I did my best and reaching both finals and uh, getting fourth and fifth place in the 200 meters was really, was really enough that you could ask from a 20 year, years old girl. Okay. What was your best moment? Um, I, I was thinking a lot about this and um, I think my best moment was when I won the European Championships because it was in Helsinki. Seven years after I watched that World Championships in 2005 on the TV from the hospital in Bulgaria, crying so bad and um, feeling so down, asking, asking myself at the time if I'm ever going to, to be at the same place, if I can go back running fast times and, you know, winning competitions, meetings, and uh, 
going back to the same place, Helsinki, and winning the European title. It was my first European title in the 100 years. It was a big moment for me. So um, for me, it was like um, the end of a very long and very hard road. It was like the end of my injury, even if it was seven years later. That was maybe the end of, of the hard road. So it's com it was coming full circle there, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm, cool. um, you have been selected as a flag bearer for the Rio Olympics in 2016 for your country. My question is, how was it or how did you receive that information? And then how was it to carry the flag of your country into the stadium? I still remember the call I got. I was coming back from uh, training and I received a call from the president of our Athletics Federation. So as, as soon as I see him calling, I said, um, there, there must be something big or serious that happened if he's calling me just two weeks before the Olympic Games. So I stopped the car, I pulled the car out of the road. Uh, I answered the call and he said, I have a great news for you. You've been selected to be the, 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 the flag barrier at the Olympic Games. And I, I started to cry because it was beautiful. And um, I remember as a kid watching the Olympic Games, this was maybe one of the moments that was most impressive for me. The people, when they entered the stadium with the flag of their country, with all, the whole team behind them, so proud, so, so happy just to be there. And it was really a big moment and it was even better in Rio and it was, um, it was amazing. The opening ceremony was like one big um, party because you know, the Brazilians are famous with the way they love music and dancing. And it was something I will never ever forget. It was really an amazing experience. I was very proud and uh, very proud of my country and very happy, it was very motivating. Mm. You did not expect it. I did not expect it, absolutely. I did not expect it because I was thinking for sure there was some, at least one Olympic champion or medalist in our team. So I never thought that they can choose me. And it was really, really amazing. Okay, cool. If you could go back in time, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, what advice would you give a younger Yvette? I would tell myself that um, you should not give too much attention to the people's opinion because I think when I was younger, I, I cared I, I cared much more about that. And uh, of course, I would tell myself that you have to be very patient because things never come easy and uh, that you need a lot of time for everything and you have to work harder every year that is coming. I actually saw you answered the same question in another interview. And I, one thing I thought was interesting, you said, surround yourself with supportive and positive people. And secondly, get rid of destructive people. Yes. <laughs> my, question, my question, that always sounds a bit obvious, but very often I think it's hard to know if someone is destructive. When do you know if someone is destructive and not good for you? I think, you know, someone is destructive when you, when you struggle, when you're in pain and uh, when they bring mostly these feelings in your life. And I think at some point we all have these people. And um, since uh, I consider myself that I have a lot of patience, that, um, that I, have, I, don't, I don't like to hurt people, there are many moments in my life that I like, um, I kept these people without reason. And uh, once you realize that and you free yourself from this, you, you, actually, you actually bloom and uh, good things happen and you know, not, nothing holds you back. So I think it's really important, but I, I learned this the hard way and uh, I learned this maybe now when, I, when I'm 35. Okay, cool. What are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete or end athlete? Well, I, I I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't consider myself anymore as a person, an athlete. They, they become one. And uh, whatever makes me happy as a person is helping me as an athlete. And my success as an athlete is also helping me and teaching me to be a better person, to have more patience, to, to work harder, to, to help others. 
So I think this, this both things, they're, they're connected. Okay. Looking at your story and career, I would also think perseverance is one of your main habits, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Do you have a morning routine? A morning routine? Um, yes, I, I wake up in the morning. I'm coming down um, in my kitchen for breakfast and um, my dog is always waiting for me because I'm usually the one in the morning who gives the food. So the, the day starts with a, with, a, with, with a big celebration that food is coming actually. So, so we actually, these things make me smile and, and feeling good and, and appreciating my life. So after I give him food, I prepare food and breakfast for me and my husband. Usually he's the one in charge for the fresh orange juice. And I prepare some, um, let's say some, some kind of sandwiches, healthy, healthy and uh, coffee. So I have this routine. Then I like to drink not one, but two espressos, long espressos and enjoy it. Looking some news, going on the social. So I, I maybe enjoy an hour or two. And uh, then I always get back up. I put my music on and I put my clothes on. I choose the clothes for the training. I put my clothes on, prepare myself and, and go for training. So I'm very repetitive and um, I can do the same thing over and over again. And I don't get bored of it. How do you prepare for important moments? I try to work mentally before the important moment so when the moment comes i i kind of relieve it so i i like to be really prepared for it i try to to focus on the things i want to happen and i try to stay calm of course and uh, most of the times it works yeah it works of course sometimes it it can happen to find yourself um, a little more disturbed or nervous or even scared at some moments that you, you, you thought you prepared. But um, I prepare working, working mentally for these moments. This is how I prepare. Of course, physically is more important, but uh, also mentally. Okay. And did the preparation change over the years? Yes, it changed a lot. I used to work with my Bulgarian coach from 96 until 2011. And from 2011, I moved to Italy. I followed my husband and I started working with his coach and he totally changed my program. And I learned so many new things and uh, it opened so, so many doors for me. The first year I came in Italy, I ran 1096. And uh, soon I also improved a lot my results in the 200 meters. Then after four years, I switched mostly to the 200 meters and I started preparing that event. And uh, now in the last, let's say one or two years, I changed again my program because I'm 35. I'll be 36 next year. And um, I kind of cut the volumes of training. So I, I think I should do more quality than quantity of training. So I try to do more quality works. Mm -hmm. How do you overcome setbacks? Oh, well, I usually need a few days. I need a few days to digest everything and to um, let it poison everything inside of me and to suffer like I let myself to this, to this pain. But after that, once, once that is, is over, I'm, I'm done with it. And uh, I use it as a motivation. So for me, I had a, a moment like this in Doha at the World Championships this year because um, in, the, in the day of the final, I was really prepared. And with the time I ran previously in the season, I could win easily a medal. But the conditions there were not what I was expecting and um, things were out of my control. So To be honest, at first, I, I was really disappointed. I, I even sit there and I started to cry. But in a few days, I realized and I focused on the positive things. And I said, wow, you, you made it again. You're again the final. 
even at the age that people were asking you, are you not retiring? Why you're still doing it? What brings you? Even at that age, you still motivate people and you show them that if you want it, nothing can stop you. You can keep doing it as long as you love it. So I use and I learned to use all these setbacks as a motivation immediately. So this was one of the reasons that I didn't want to have a cake. I didn't went to any vacation this year, honestly. It was like working for me. It was just some time off the track, but working on other projects. And it's what, it is what makes me wake up with a smile every day now, go to the track and do my job because I know that Tokyo is, is just behind the corner. Okay, cool. I have a bit of a difficult question for you, but um, I, I watched... A bit of a story to that. I watched an interview with uh, Monica Seles. Uh, for those who don't know, Monica Seles is a former tennis player. She was dominating the world of tennis. What made it very special is she was dominating the person who was dominating until then. And she got stepped down and couldn't continue her career. Or not to the same level as before. Um, so in that interview, she said... She's happy now, but she still has the what ifs in her mind. What would have happened if I wouldn't have that accident? My question to you, I saw your personal best in the 100 meters was before you broke your femur. Do you have what ifs in your head? Of course I have. Um, I have because um, I started my season in 2005 in a really good way. I had only one race, I think, in the 100 meters, and I ran 11.03, which was so promising. And um, I'll be honest, the, the goal that we set for that year was the European record in the 100, that, was, uh, that is 10.73. So my goal was really to, to run uh, in, the, in the low 10.70s. But, you know, you never know what is going to happen in your life. So the way that things happen, I, I, I accept that it must be that way. And it helped me to try to achieve my best. And yeah, I ran 1096 after that, only two decim close to the 1077. But my, I made my PBs in the 60 meters. I made my PB in the 200 meters. So I still found, you know, a, a way a ways to, to improve them and to, to get better. And uh, if I go back, I'm, I, I'm sorry for myself and for this incident, but um, I don't know who I was going to be today if this didn't happen. And I think that it made me the person I am today. And uh, it's part of my career. And it's one of the reasons maybe even that I'm successful. Yeah. Okay, really cool. Who is your role model and why? Ah, growing up, I, I was uh, always like rejecting the idea that uh, the coaches were teaching us that you should have this as a role model, you should have that as a role model. So I, I respect so many people in the world of sport and not only. So my role models are so many people who overcome something, who are trying to help others, who... As I say now, I, I, will, I will talk about the girl that we see that they win medals after motherhood, coming back to the track. So my mo role models are people who not only overcome something, but they fight for the others. They help the others. They leave a trace behind them. Not just people who came for a year and made a world record and then disappeared or won a medal and then nobody heard of them anymore. So the, the people that are, are my role models are more people, they can be normal, not, not big stars, but helping, leaving something behind them. Legacy, nice. Legacy. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? One of the best advices I ever received was uh, when I was um, really young, 19 years old. It was right before the, the year of the Olympic Games in Athens. So let's say that right before my first very successful season, it was from a, a former Bulgarian sprinter that she just ended her career. And that advice was to always invest 
at least half of what you make from the track back to get better. So this was a great advice because by that time, I didn't realize it, but um, to be honest, I'm, I'm doing the same. You can't only want to receive and you, you can't expect always to receive things. You have to really reinvest them in yourself. And as more athletes, and I think athletes from all kinds of sports really this, uh, more success they will have because there are people who once they receive something, they say, okay, that's it. I made it from here on the app and everything will get bigger. But I think this was very good because it, it teached me at a very young age that uh, you have to save for the future, that you never know what's coming. And you know, you know sport, you get injured, you, you break your leg and maybe your career is over. So always keep something aside and always reinvest in yourself in the name of bigger success. Nice. How does a typical training day look like? It looks like, as I told you about the morning routine, from then on, I'm getting on my car, I'm going, I'm going to the track. I work there for maybe two to three hours maximum. Then I'll have a lunch. Usually my husband is, uh, is with me all the time in the morning during my training. He works in the afternoon because he's a physio now. So we have lunch, then I have a little rest in the afternoon. And at this time of the year, that is the winter training, I do also second workout in the afternoon. I'll go to the gym and do some extra exercises or some track workout. So yeah, then, uh, then I will chill a little bit. I will watch some Netflix. I will go to buy some groceries and I will cook dinner. Um, in Italy, you know, people are very, very strict with the food and eating times. So they eat lunch at one <laughs> and they eat dinner at eight. So I love to prepare dinner. I love, I love to cook. I have a big kitchen that is really nice and um, I enjoy the time in it. After dinner, I watch a movie or something chilling, not, not going out so much when I'm training. And uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll go to bed. Okay. How did the training change over the years, considering you preparing for Athens and then for Rio? You said you do more quality work, the older you or the, the more advanced you are in your career? It really changed because... Um, When I was young, I was really saved. I love to say this. I was saved from my coach. And thanks to this, I can keep running until now, 35, 36. I can, I can, I can go on because my, my body is healthy. And I think this is the most important thing for every athlete. So um, then I started to train hard around the years that I achieved my first big results. 2003, 2004, 2005. And after I broke my leg, we really reduced a lot of training. And I think that was one of the reasons I couldn't come back with my former coach running good times. Because uh, not only I was traumatized, but he also witnessed what happened with me and how I broke my leg. And for him to give me hard trainings and see me pushing myself to the limit after that was always harder. I realized this with the time. So when I moved to Italy in 2011, I realized what is real training because uh, my, my coach that is here has a really tough program of training. So I, I love to joke about it, but it's, it should not be a joke. I learned what is real training at the age of 30. And uh, This continued a few years after, and by the age of 32, 33, I started to reduce this, yeah, the, the volumes, and uh, you know that with the time, you lose speed, you get slower, your nervous system is getting slower, but you get more resistive and uh, powerful. So I think that in all my career, I missed this resistance in, in the way I was running. I hated to run longer. I hate it now too, but uh, I don't struggle that much. It's easier. Like if you ask me to run 400 meters, I can do it now. I couldn't do it 10 years ago. I'm uh, much stronger now with my power. I can squat with the, 
more than 140 kilos and my weight is 54 so it's almost three times my weight and uh, yeah these are the things that change so i try to to work in a way to compromise that losing of speed with the time and be more resistant and powerful mm, okay do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed um no i don't want to nominate i i think that you already have in your mind i'm sure you have already in your mind some people but uh, yeah maybe you can choose some other athlete because i think that we have really interesting stories really cool um i saw you have an academy sprint academy in your home country where you promote the basic ideals and principles and values of sport what are these principles for you these principles for me at um is first all the kids to be able to do sports. Because as I mentioned before, when I, when I wanted to start to do train, track and field, I couldn't find a coach. So for me, this is the, the, the main thing that all kids should do sport if they want. And uh, then the other principles, especially for my academy, are that we don't discriminate people. So I, I told also the people that I work with in the academy and uh, that I'm bossing sometimes, I say that I don't want that, uh, that we say no to nobody. It means ethnicity, color, um, disabilities, age. I love what track is giving to the people and the world, what is athletics, how it unites people. I consider ourselves as, a, as one big family. And uh, this is what I want my club in Bulgaria to be. I want it to, all the people to, to feel part of it, to feel part of this family. And I want through that club to give back the love I received in all these years to everybody who needs it. If he's a kid, if he's a, an, an athlete, if he's just, you know, somebody who just likes to run. So, yeah, I think that athletics is for everybody. Yeah, that's really cool. And that also goes back to what you said a little bit before. You want to invest what you get back. Yeah. So it's not only financial, but you're also giving back to the society. That's really nice. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I can kind of get to a point of, of my life um, that it hit me that I want to start to give back. Hmm. And I realized how much I received in all my life and career. And I want to start to give back. Really nice. Where can people find you? Oh, they can find me on the social networks. I, I was kind of uh, mixed with mixed feelings in the beginning and uh, it was uh, too explosive for me to be on the socials all the time. But now I start to love it because I see that it, it motivates people. It motivates young kids to do sports and athletics. And it's also a, a great connection, great connection. Of course, sometimes this connection is dangerous because It also a connection with all kinds of weirdos, but uh, it's a great connection with people who are looking for help, who are looking for advice, connection with, um, with companies, sponsors, endorsement deals. So I, I love the socials the way they are today. Yeah. Really cool. Yvette, thanks a lot for your time. And I keep my fingers crossed for your qualification for Tokyo and then obviously success in Tokyo. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much for this interview. It was, it was great. It was my big pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.